you're you're leveraging money to buy an asset, not a liability. Like borrowing money to buy a liability is of course not smart. But if you borrow money to buy an asset, people don't haven't a lot of them haven't fully grasped that if you're buying an asset, it produces cash. So use the cash the asset produces to pay off who you borrowed the money from. And eventually you'll end up owning the asset without any debt and you know you're using other people's money. So it's a it's kind of a a, a simple but it has this nuances, uh, you know, leverage hack that a lot of people are starting to realize. Are you looking to achieve massive success in your life without dealing with costly investment nightmares? If yes, then this is the podcast for you. Here, we provide engineers and busy professionals all the secrets and strategies to create multiple streams of income, build generational wealth, and live a meaningful life by design. Here's your host, Ted Patel. Welcome, Decoding Cashflow listeners. Today, we have a very special guest, Sam Prem, who is a veteran real estate investor. Sam has built a $45 million worth of real estate portfolio and without using his own money. So that's, that's, a, that's the thing we're going to talk about in this show also. And currently, he owns more than 150 single-family rentals and has flipped more than 1,000 properties. He also owns a, a property management company and is a founder of Faster Freedom, which teaches people like uh, busy professionals how to keep, quit their job and become successful real estate investors. So, Sam, welcome to Decoding Cashflow. It's a pleasure having you here. I'm excited to dig in and chat and see if we can provide some value for your listeners. I'm sure you will. All right. So, Sam, before we get started uh, discussing about what you do right now, let's go all the way back on, you know, what did you do before you got into real estate and how did you transition to real estate? Yeah, so I was, you know, doing what most people do. And what I thought I was going to do was I, you know, graduated college, got a good job and was in the real world and fully expected to just continue that normal W2 corporate path, which is not a bad path. And because that was what I was taught to do. Then a few years in, I, you know, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and learned a little bit about, you know, assets and liabilities and a lot of the things that we weren't taught growing up. And that steered me in the direction of real estate. So in 2014, uh, me and a buddy started investing in real estate on the side with full time jobs. So, you know, for the, the next three or four years, we were working weekends and evenings and, and, you know, doing a few flips here, doing a few rentals there and really just kind of digging into real estate and learning through, you know, mistakes and trial by error, trial by fire, and and really went in um, to it that way. So we had done, you know, a handful of flips, maybe had 15 or 20 rentals and some wholesales. And then, you know, three or four years in, 2018 is when uh, we decided to quit our W-2 jobs and go all in. And that's really when we were able to make some traction going from spending 10 hours a week to doing something to spending 60 hours a week doing it. You're naturally going to get further faster. So, um, you know, not a super exciting, you know, story, just kind of stumbled upon uh, real estate and then got hooked and went all in. All right. So how, how did he uh, get an idea? Of course, you read this Rich Dad Poor Dad which inspired you to get into real estate, but uh, ready to get an experience or, you know, uh, uh, some backing or, you know, uh, to, to get started, you know? Yeah, I think, I think maybe being naive is, is a good answer. Cause we didn't have, you know, a time, we didn't have any money. Um, I knew you could uh, borrow money to buy real estate just from watching like literally like HGTV with uh, uh, what flip or flop with uh, that Torco Musa gentleman. Um, I, I just remember seeing him going to like uh, uh, his lawyer buddy and borrowing money to flip a house and splitting the profits with him. So um, we didn't do exactly that, but I knew you could, you could borrow money and I didn't have enough money to buy a rental or a flip or anything. So we ended up just talking to people for several months and finally got someone that was willing to lend us money for that initial purchase and rehab. And we realized that we could refinance out and get our money back and be in a deal with no money. And, and that's what we did. And then we've done it, you know, a few hundred times since then. Yeah. And uh, as I said, right, borrowing money from others to invest in real estate. Uh, many people think like, uh, you know, you got to have a lot of uh, money in the bank account before you can start looking for the properties, right? Especially in the areas like New York, New Jersey, where the property prices are like sky high. 
so people even don't start looking into the real estate investment aspect because uh, they don't have much balance in their account. Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing that you did, you know, uh, many people are not aware of, uh, you know, you can uh, leverage other people's money to buy the real estate. You can split the profit. It's a win-win situation for both of them. And uh, that's how you scale. And, uh, and um, I was also in the same boat, you know, till, till uh, like 2018, I used my own money. I, I was like, you know, uh, why should I ask money from someone? Maybe I was a little hesitant to ask for money from anyone, you know, uh, not even for a hard money lender. I didn't go to the hard money lenders also. And uh, some, then, then uh, my mindset switched a little bit. It's like, you know, I'm making money. I have a partner who is interested in real estate. We both can make money. It's a win-win situation for both of us. I can scale faster. And while money is sitting in his bank account, uh, instead of having money sitting in his bank account, the money can work for him. And he can get a much higher return on his investment than the regular stock markets or, you know, wherever he invests, in, maybe even 401k. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a it's a win-win for sure. That's how we look at it. You're providing them with a way to diversify their investment portfolio. You're not asking for them to write you a check for their entire life savings. You're asking for them to diversify some type of vehicle they have, whether it be their personal house via a HELOC. Uh, 401k that you can borrow against, you know, up to 50%, um, you know, uh, that's seasoned in there or IRA, you can self-direct. So you're just going to these people that are normal everyday people and you're asking them, you know, if they're willing to diversify part of their retirement plan to invest in a new asset class that is backed by you and backed by real estate. And it allows, you know, them to, you know, potentially retire faster, sooner, or just have more of an income stream and it allows you to grow. So it, it's truly is, it truly is a win-win. Yeah. So um, do you focus just in St. Louis area or you do it nationwide? Um, so we just invest, uh, we just invest locally here in St. Louis as far as our personal investments. So, you know, like you mentioned earlier, we, um, you know, flip 250 to 300 houses a year, wholesale and flip. And then um, we have rentals and they're all mainly in St. Louis. Now, I I do teach nationally and, and have, you know, uh, community members in all 50 states. But as far as my active investing, it's all here in St. Louis. St. Louis. And when you got started, right, you, as you said, you started with fix and flip. What made you move into buy and hold uh, segment? Well, buy, yeah. So I think I realized that, um, you know, fixing and flipping and wholesaling, that's great, but that's active income. And when you stop doing that, you stop making money. Um, yeah. Where the tax savings comes in, where the wealth is built is through holding assets, not flipping assets. So, I mean, I've, I've always pretty much quit very quickly done a mixture of both. Um, so just understanding what assets mean and understanding that you can still borrow money to buy assets and hold them. And that's where the wealth is created. You know, um, you know, my companies that flip and wholesale are great. But they're maybe sellable, maybe not. But my rentals that I own are for sure sellable, and they will sure they will for sure build wealth for me. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, it builds a legacy for you. Um, and it's always have, good to have a passive income in addition to the active income. That's uh, what I believe. Also, you know, uh, so these rental, the rental portfolio, uh, you, as you mentioned, it's all in St. Louis. So when when did you started building the rental portfolio? Same you, of how many years after yeah, you started? Time the, frame. Yeah, 2014. Same time frame. So I've been working yeah. on that for about 10 years now. And, you know, 90% of it, you know, 80% of it was done after I quit my job and went all in and was able to fully focus on it. But yeah, um, mm-hmm. I've been doing kind of all three throughout the entire time. That's kind of allowed for me to you know, buy bad deals here and there, you know, and just have different streams of income and different different solutions for a property now we buy a property and we can flip it right and and take it down we can wholesale it or we can keep it as a rental so we have multiple options and multiple exit strategies per property that really kind of take some of that that risk out of it and allows you to diversify and do you use like a burr method to uh, to finance and then use the money to invest in other properties yep 100 i'm sure you do yeah. everything 
everything with the BRS method, um, everything from our single families to our multis to our to our self storage. So everything we've done to a hotel, we actually own a hotel. Um, so oh, we've wow. done everything with the BRS method. Um, you know, with leveraging other people's money because it's you're you're leveraging money to buy an asset, not a liability. Like borrowing money to buy a liability is, of course, not smart. But if you yeah. borrow money to buy an asset, people don't haven't a lot of them haven't fully grasped but if you're buying an asset it produces cash so use the cash the asset produces to pay off who you borrowed the money from and eventually you'll end up owning the asset without any debt and you know you're using other people's money so it's a it's kind of a a, a simple but it has this nuances uh you know leverage hack that a lot of people are starting to realize yeah and uh talking about the burr method right uh many of the people who might not know what burr method is would you take some time out to explain our listeners what exactly the burr method is and how to leverage it yeah for sure so the burr method stands for buy rehab rent refinance and i i had an s for systemize but buy rehab rent refinance and systemize so we'll walk through a deal and i'll, I'll use simple math so hopefully yeah. people can understand what i'm talking about so what you do is you borrow money to buy a distressed property so for example let's say you have a private lender so you borrow a um, hundred thousand dollars from a private lender to buy a distressed property so it's their money in the deal they gave you the money and you bought the house with it um, and then the house needs work because it's distressed. Let's say it needs 50 grand. So you borrow 50 grand from them as well. So in total, a private lender is giving you $150,000 cash, which sounds crazy, but it's really not, um, you know, as far as, you know, it's the, the collateral is the asset. Um, you can personally guarantee a lot of different things. So they give you 150 grand and you buy the house and repair it. That's the B, the first B, and then the R. Um, and then the next thing you do is get the property rented. You still owe them money, but you get it rented. You make it a cash producing asset. You need to make it producing cash and you have a tenant in it. Then you take go on to the refinance step. Um, so you get the property refinanced and you bought it to stress and you added value. So this property, let's say appraised for 200 grand. So a bank will give you a cash out refinance loan for 80% of the appraised value. 80% of 200 grand is 160 grand. So you take that 160 grand, and you pay back your private lender their 150 grand plus interest. So now they're paid off. They're good. They got their money, their principal, and interest. Now you owe the bank money, but that's a 25, 30 year mortgage, um, you know, with a with a good interest rate on it. And then you just use the rent to pay back the bank. So you're just using other people's money to pay other people back. And at the end of the day, you own the house. And you can do that as many times as you want. There's no limit to how many times you can do it. And then I like to add the S for systemize. You kind of systemize each step that allows you to scale. The difference between the professionals and the amateurs are, are basically systems for scalability. So that's kind of a, a Burr's 101. All right. Now, talking about the system for scalability, would you like to explain a little bit more on that? What are the systems that you have implemented to scale your portfolio? Yeah. So scaling by definition just means doing more, right? Growing. So yeah. if you want to grow, you naturally have to create systems around your process. So yeah. this process is the BRRRRS method. So let's take buy. If you can create systems around having multiple private lenders, multiple hard money lenders, maybe some lines of credit, and you have systems to trade track those, those, that money, and you have systems to communicate with those lenders, you're able to get a deal and get funding that same day. And you're able to do more deals along that B step, creating systems around leads. If you have a lead flow system, whether it be through connections and networking or marketing, creating systems so that you have constant lead flow coming in and constant lead and constant funding to make the two match and close quickly, you're naturally going to do more than wandering around trying to find a house and then wandering around trying to find a lender. You could, should be able to five or 10 extra volume. And similarly with rehabbing, you can rehab the house and figure everything out and write your, you know, your budget on a napkin, or you can have systems as far as scope of works that you give to contractors, communication yeah. with contractors, payment schedules, a list of contractors, a list of materials. Naturally, if you have all that in place, you can maybe go from doing two flips a year to 10 and that's five X in your output. So you just kind of work and create systems throughout the process. And that, that's what I educate people on. But of course, people can do it on their own. But just having the discipline to systemize each step and process each step will just naturally allow you to move through it more effectively, therefore do more. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, rightly said, it's all about the process. Once you have a process, you refine the process, keep improving it uh, till, you know, uh, 
till you start scaling uh, as you did. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, talking about uh, uh, lead flow, I, I know you mostly buy distressed properties in, in your early stage, maybe now also. Uh, what are the strategies that you implement to get these leads for the distressed property? What are the different avenues you source it from? Yeah, there's like almost unlimited ways to get distressed properties, but I'll cover kind of the the, the basic ones. You know, we mm-hmm. have 35 or 40 different ways that we utilize to find distressed properties. But the simplest one for those with, you know, most people listening, probably, you know, W-2 jobs, the simplest mm-hmm. one for those that have jobs and that are busy is to use wholesalers. And, and what wholesalers mm-hmm. do is they do all the work. They do all the work. They spend the marketing dollars. They spend the time, energy, and effort to get these properties under contract. And then they bring them to you on a silver platter. Now, of course, they're going to mark it up. And of course, you have to make sure that they work. Not all of the wholesalers yeah. bring you deals and actually yeah. pencil out. However, they do all the heavy lifting, the negotiating, and they they just bring you the deal. So your job is to connect with the people that are connecting with the deal. So they're just wholesale and they're a middleman, middlewoman. So they're in the middle there. So your your purpose is to um, you know connect with wholesalers, and we buy probably fifty houses a year from wholesalers here in St. Louis because we've developed relationships with them, and that's a good steady lead flow that's free. Uh, minus our time, you know, connecting with them. So um, wholesalers are a great option. Uh, real estate agents are another great option. There's, you know, real estate agents are everywhere. Not, not all of them understand investing, but a lot of them yeah. do. You go to that real estate agent and you connect with them and you're going to, you know, they're going to sell 10 or 15 houses a year, or buy them, you know, through the retail process. And maybe one or two of them is a hoarder house, an outdated property, a sticky situation, a pre-foreclosure, something that's when they bring you those distressed properties. Like, I don't know that people understand distressed properties are a small percentage of real estate deals, but real estate is such a large industry that it's still a large value. 2% of a hundred is not very much. 2% of 50 trillion, that's a lot. So there is a lot of distressed properties. You just have to get in front of people that, that, that find them and real estate agents tend to do the same thing. And we always tell people you get five good wholesalers, five good real estate agents, 10 good connectors you can probably buy 10 to 15 houses a year by doing that. Now, of course, you're going to have to spend time, energy, and effort doing that. But yeah. those are the the main ways that I teach my people to go out and find deals because very few people have extra money to send out $10,000 in direct mail every single month and answer the phone call yeah. and deal with people getting mad, go look at the property, negotiate with the seller. Like there's lots of steps that are involved in going direct to seller. So just, just go to the middleman and uh, let them do all the work, and then they make their fee when you buy it. So that's usually where I tell people to look first. All right. So any, anyone who wants to get started initially while doing the nine to five, this is the main uh, path or you will suggest to look into, right? And yeah, sure. uh, do you do you buy anything for, from auctions? I, I started, you know, when I started my career, uh, I started buying distressed property from sheriff sale auctions. Do you do that also? We have done that in the past, and that's uh, in the past, and that's a great one. It's just, you know, I haven't had the cash to do it. Is a little trickier for people, um, and you know, there's some risk involved, especially if you can't get in the property. But you know, we we have done that in the past. We used to buy ten or fifteen a year from sheriff sales, but it just for a while there just seemed to get more competitive with hedge funds coming in and somebody on the phone with somebody with the money and they're just, they can go higher than you can because they're the end buyer and they don't need to make as much margin. So it got pretty competitive there for a while. I have heard that it's a little less competitive these days than it was maybe two, three years ago, but uh, we we haven't really gone back. So we we used to do that at a, a decent clip by one, maybe two a month, but we don't anymore. Mm-hmm. All right. And what are you mean? Uh, how do you underwrite these deals? Uh, like, what are the numbers you look at and, you know, put together to make sure it's a good deal? Yeah. So we use the max allowable offer formula, which is, and I'll break it down. It's ARV times 70, 75% minus repairs. So um, ARV is after repair value. So what the house is worth after it's fixed up. Um, that's the market value. That's what a seller or that's what a buyer is going to look at if they're looking to buy your house. That's what the banks can look at if they're looking to refinance your house. So you're doing what they're going to do. You're just doing it ahead of time. So we try to find three houses that are in similar condition to that what our house will be after it's fixed up, after repair value. So we take the after repair value times 75%, let's say, and then you, you subtract out all your repairs, 
your holding costs and all the money that's going to go into the deal. And that gives you your max allowable offer. So, you know, you're basically building in a 25% profit margin and you're accounting for all your expenses and all your re rehabs and repairs. So obviously not every repair comes in on budget and not yeah. every ARV is right. That's why we really tell people to build in some fluff. If you think it's a $300,000 house, say it's a $290,000 house. Yeah. If you think it needs 50 grand, say it needs 60 grand. And if you're conservative in your ARV and you're conservative in your repair cost value, then you should be okay for some you know, mistakes and things that will come up. Yeah. And obviously you want to buy it as low as possible, but that's why, you know, you're, it's usually someone else on the deal. So that's why you have to do it that way. Of course, it'd be great to do ARV times 50% minus repairs, right? You're going to have way more profit margin, but you might not get the deal. So you got to find that line of your risk tolerance and how high you want to go and how good you are at figuring out the ARV um, and the repairs because they're, 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 they're kind of like a science and kind of like an art at the same time, both of them figuring those things out. Have you seen recently because of this competitive market, the uh, the twenty five percent buffer that you have for profit have, have you seen it uh, uh, compressing a little bit or in your area? Oh uh, yeah, maybe a little bit. That's why I say seventy to seventy five percent. There for a while we were doing eighty percent just to make sure we got the deals because it was yeah. you know everybody back in 2019, 2020, 2021, Everybody was I mean it was it was insane. Um, yeah. You know people overbought, over rehabbed, and still made a big profit. Um, that those days are gone, which is a good thing, I think. Um, but yeah, we we will sometimes go down to 70. But again, if you're if you're conservative on that ARV and you conservative on that rehab and build in some fluff, you you know, giving exact ARVs and exact rehab budgets at 70% is the same as giving conservative ARVs and conservative rehab budgets at 75%. So you're you're saying the same thing. We 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 try to be a little bit tighter with that now. And and if you're wholesaling it, you just subtract out your wholesaling fee. You know, you want to make 10 grand, 20 grand, just run those numbers minus 20 grand or whatever you want to make. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, lending, right, of, or, or refinancing, uh, what are the suggestions that uh, you like to do to our listeners to refinance the property um, uh, or before they refinance the property? How, how sh what are the uh paperworks or you know uh, things that they need to consider to get the highest value or the highest loan from the bank yeah so that's 100 percent. you want to get the most amount um from the bank so you can get the most yeah. money back because they're going to give yeah. you loan 80 percent value if the house is worth 200 like i said they'll give you a check for 160 if the house is worth 250 they'll give you a check for whatever 80 percent of that is yeah. um you know 210 whatever that is so They'll give you a bigger check the more the, the, the house is worth. So what we do is um, we make our houses probably a little nicer than they have to be. We like to make our rentals somewhere. We say we want to make our rentals um, somewhere where somebody wants to live, not has to live. So we put granite. Uh, we do luxury vinyl plank instead of like carpet or cheap vinyl flooring. So we want to make the houses a little bit nicer because you get a higher appraisal. Uh, you get better tenants. But then also you potentially have less maintenance. We like yeah. to say we want to make it to where in a tenant moves out in three years, we're cleaning, not replacing. Cleaning luxury vinyl plank, you can, you can do a lot to that before you damage it. But carpets, you're probably going to have to replace. So we spend a little more than most people on our rehabs and make them a little bit nicer. We get better tenants, higher appraisal, and less maintenance. And then like a, a little extra tip going a little bit deeper would be making sure to uh, meet the appraisal, the appraiser at the property and walking okay. through your scope and everything. So um, okay. that is that is a big thing that we do that really seems to make a big, big difference. Yeah. And as you said, right, the nicer property gets the higher rent and higher rents will appraise to a higher value. So yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now talking about uh, leveraging other people's money, what are the different ways you can go and, uh, or maybe what, what are the different segment of people uh, where you can go and uh, get, get the money needed for your investment? Yeah, there's a, there's more money out there than deals. People don't always realize that, but um Leverage, it, it's something that scares some people, but I realized a, a lot, especially over the past few years, it's the like secret that the wealthy people don't tell you about, right? Like we're normal people. Now there's wealthy people 
don't use their own cash for investments. They leverage yeah. other people's money. So um, if you're leveraging money to buy an asset, um, you know, there's not a ton of risk involved. As I alluded to earlier, if you're leveraging money to buy a liability, there potentially is. So um, there's a ton of different places to find money. The main ones that you're going to come across if you're wanting to get into this game is private money, hard money, and then kind of small local banks are your kind of main things you're going to try to build relationships with. And those are all relational businesses. So yeah. private lenders are just individuals, you know, hard money lenders are companies that are in business to lend you money, a little stricter criteria, but they will lend money. And then small local banks are banks that have an appetite to take on loans on rental properties. Not all banks do, but small local banks usually do. So those are your kind of three pools that you're going yeah. to need to kind of start to uh, attack and go after. Okay. And uh, when you borrow the money from third party, right? Uh, not a bank or a hard money lender, but let's say your friends and family. How do you structure the deal? Like, uh, are they the joint? Are they in the joint venture, or they just uh, uh, invest? Or once you refi, you give them money back. How does it work for you? Like, what's your strategies? Yeah. So at first, we were we had did at uh, we would have them be you know on the deed of trust, um, you know, on the property as partial owner. Um, you know, we'd have them on the insurance policy. We did some personal guarantees even at first. So making them feel very secure and usually giving them, you know, that 10 to 12 percent return annualized. But as we have grown and as we have proven ourselves and have we have scaled and made more connections, we're more like we give, you know, seven to eight percent return annualized on your money. Um, and we're usually just do a promissory note. We usually don't have to do the joint venture or give them on the deal or anything like that. And I think that's pretty standard for people. Once you've done 10 or 15 deals with someone, they've built a trust in your ability to perform. And then that all that paperwork is fine, but it's just a little bit more of a hassle for everybody. So right now we're usually seven to eight uh, percent promissory note. We just pay them upon sale or refinance, not 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 anything in between or before. And this promissory note goes out from the from your company or it's a personal guarantee? Uh promissory note from the company. From the company. All right. All right. And uh any any uh do you do any 501b or uh, 506b or 506c anything as such any no, funds no, no. anything nothing mm -hmm. okay so nothing in syndication you, you nothing just, in syndication uh, everything that we buy and own is uh, me and my business partner so i have a business partner but we own we own 100 percent of, of everything all right. And that's how you can like to keep it, right? 100% ownership. For now, yeah. I think maybe eventually we'll get into syndication. Um, you know, I, I right now at this point in my life, I'd rather own uh, $10 million myself than, you know, you know, 10% of a hundred million. So even though that's the same ownership, mm -hmm. right? So maybe eventually syndicate, I think I could maybe with my social media and our experience, but uh, eventually we may get into that. But right now we're just kind of grooving with what we're doing. It seems to work. We have enough private lending connections and seem to be getting them that we're able to take down as much as we want up to this mm -hmm. point uh, with, uh, without having to syndicate. And uh, how about uh, maintaining uh, a relationship with the in investors, right? Do you have any any suggestions on how to attract the investors or and how to maintain the relationship with the investors going forward so that you know they just uh, keep rolling their investment in your next and uh, next project i think the biggest thing is just communicating everything the process as you're doing it having a uh, you know a professional presentation even if you're talking to your parents or your grandparents or your friends or your family friends whatever it is being professional having a you know professional presentation with an agenda with all the documents lined up and explain the process uh, protecting them maybe giving them you know 10 12 percent at first uh, a little bit higher percentage and just just get a few deals done and then you can start to um continue to to move that forward i i think pretty much every lender we've used has grown their has grown their you know guidance limit with us you know here's we'll give you 150 grand do a few deals okay now we'll give you 500 grand let's try to keep that as busy as possible so i think it's all in communication and preparation i think um they'll see that you're treating this as a business opportunity and you know them because they're private lenders some type of relationship um that'll help them see a little more seriously than just hey you know we're trying this thing out can you give me some money yeah and uh, with uh, more than 150 properties, right? Single family rentals, as you mentioned. Uh, how, do you mean, how do you keep track of maintaining, renting? How do you do that? 
a good team. I, I don't I don't do any of that. So we have a, a property management team. So we manage all of our 300 properties um, units um, in house with the team, okay. and then we're actually starting to manage for other people now that we've got the systems and processes right. Now that we got the systems and processes down, we're starting to manage for other people. No, so we have a I have a, a COO of our of our um, you know of our rental portfolio that the management of our, of our property management company with a property manager, some assistant property manager, some maintenance tech. So we just kind of do everything in house and have just grown it as our portfolio has grown. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, what do you think about the current market situation with the interest rate this high? Of course, it's coming down a little bit, uh, but uh, uh, where, where do you, what do you think about the current market situation and how, you know, people, uh, should they just wait till the interest rate comes down, according to you, or just dive into the real estate right away? And uh, if the number makes sense, go ahead with it uh, or hold for a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think there's any point in waiting. Um, most people that try to time the market end up missing. And if it's yeah. the perfect time, it's already passed kind of thing. So I tell people to get in right now. Um, historically, interest rates, even before they're getting ready to go down a little bit, are still pretty low. And this has just shown what a lot of us have said for a long time. Supply and demand is the number one driver of values. Interest rates have an effect, but an effect. They're not the core. The core is the supply and demand. Um, yeah. Interest rates have went up like historically quickly over the past few years, and the then the real estate market didn't crash. There were some areas that dipped and less less of an increase. But if interest rates at most other times in history went up as quick as they did, it would have made the market half. So yeah. that just shows to go. That just goes to show that supply is the driving factor. So I'll tell people to get in. Um, people that say you can't cash flow right now are usually people that aren't professionals or don't really understand the process. Like we're still able to buy rentals at cash flow. Maybe we're not cash flowing. 350 bucks, maybe it's 200 bucks, but we're still cash flowing uh, because we understand the process and are buying deeper, getting better tenants, getting more for rent, uh, lowering maintenance. We're able to still cash flow um, to the, in today's market. So I tell people get in, um, especially right now with uh, with the potential of interest rates going down. Because if it's if interest rates go down drastically, that means house prices are going to go up drastically. That's a yeah. it, that's a very very connected relationship that's been proven in the history. So if interest rates go down, you know, a point next year, a point and a half, prices are going to go up, and it's probably going to negate your uh, less interest rate with a higher monthly payment because you're going to be putting a loan on a higher value because the house yeah. price went up. So there's no real scenario. And that I can see in the next, you know, 12, 24, 36 months, yeah. it's going to be like, get in now. House price values are low. Interest rates are low. Supply is high. Demand, there's no there's no magical scenario. The only magical scenario is actually investing. Yeah. Get into real estate, get into the investment right now and refinance. Once the interest rate goes down, it will increase your cash flow anyways, right? Marry the house, date the rate. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. So, uh, Sam, uh, just uh, keeping time into consideration, I uh, would like to move to the final round of questions. But before that, is there, uh, I wanted to discuss about uh, your uh, your venture in faster freedom, right? Uh, the course or, or that you have designed. What is it about, uh, if you can give our listeners a little bit summary on what do you teach in that course and how it can help them? Yeah, so it, it's a, just a community um, based on my experiences in real estate. So we teach and coach people how to invest in real estate using none of their own money. Um, that's the core of it. Um, we have a ton of people wholesaling and we have a ton of people flipping and a ton of people owning rentals. Those are kind of the three main categories that we teach people how to do it with little of their nothing to none of their own money. We got about 1,800 students now across the country. So it's a really cool just place to go get coached. Get your hand held, have resources at your fingertips. I, I take all my systems and processes from my active businesses and, and introduce them to students um, as, as they grow. So yeah, it's something I'm really proud of. And it's really fun to see somebody go from being a teacher, uh, making three grand a month to owning 60 rentals and people that are just absolutely doing really well that put in the work, energy and effort. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a pretty cool thing to see. It's a couple years old now and it, it's really fun. We just teach the things that we do based on best practices that we've made. So the goal is for people to make less mistakes, have less headaches and make more progress than they would on their own. Yeah. Learn from your mistakes, right? Yep. 
in short because it's it's always wise to get a sometimes you know it's as as i always say uh wise to get a coach who has an experience in what you want to do it will shorten the time frame for you to succeed whatever you can accomplish in 5 years maybe with a coach or a mentor you can accomplish in one or two years in and less uh, mis- you'll make less mistakes down the road mm-hmm. yeah no it's you're not going to grow and scale to any degree without paying for it you either pay for it through mistakes or you pay for it through education, learning somebody else's mistakes. There's just not really a path that doesn't involve paying money. It's either going to be through inefficiencies, loss of money on a deal, loss of equity, no cash flow, or paying to learn somebody else's groove path. It's just, you're, we're creating wealth here. So it does require some type of financial commitment and you can do it on your own and have headaches, or you can yeah. pay money from to somebody that um, has already done it and you can follow their systems. I, I don't know anybody that's successful that doesn't pay for some type of coach or mentorship or community or mastermind. I, I don't know one. So the yeah. smart people that have made the money realize that it's in large part to the fact that they're following somebody else's path. Yeah. And and the other thing I'd like to add is, you know, uh, when I started, right, I, maybe I went a different way. I didn't pay for the uh, coaching, but I, I had a mentor, a friend of a friend uh, who, for whom I worked for free for like six months, you know, learning all the construction related, uh, you know, nitty gritty from him, following him, everything. So either either you pay by money or you pay by time, but mm-hmm. you got to learn from you. You need a mentor of who can teach you the right path and you know the right strategies. I like it. Yeah, I agree with you. It's it's and time is the one aspect we can't get back. So you can yeah. like yeah, like you said you can learn from somebody else's slowly um, through social media and stuff. But there's only so many ways to connect and ways to help through social media and a podcast or, or you know, a yeah. YouTube or anything like that, that connection, that connectivity, that, that implementation process is done via um, people talking. Yeah. All right, Sam, uh, would like to move to the final round of questions. Are we ready? Yep. All right. So the first one, which is the one book that you'll recommend which had the most impact on your life or your business? You said one of them. Let's yes, I wish that book, book. that's a great one um, <laughs> for like getting started. What's impacted my business is to help me grow and scale. It, it's called Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's okay. a really good book. It just digs into what companies have done. And this could be applicable to a solopreneur, a smaller company. It doesn't have to be the big companies that he kind of goes through in the book, but just processes and simple things that companies have done in, you know, they've all done like, you know, a, a handful of things the same that have helped them go from a good company to a great company. And the the other companies that he kind of references didn't do those things. So it's a pretty cool mm-hmm. book. It just allows you to really focus and it's got a lot of really cool um, analogies and things. So good to great by Jim Collins. Awesome. All right. Uh, what are your main source of information to learn and grow? Uh, through, you know, trial and error and doing it. And then also through masterminds. I, I said, uh, you know, I don't know anybody successful that doesn't pay for coaching. I, I, you know, there's a lot more people, a lot more successful than me, but I've done pretty good. And I, you know, I, I spend, uh, well into the six figures to be around other people that uh, are where I want to be and are at the next level. And I've done that for years and st- Certain times I've kind of made my way to uh, the top of the room and, and you know, don't get as much out of it. So I'll pay more money to be more uncomfortable and be the lowest totem pole person in the next room. So um, paying to be in rooms where others um, realities are your dreams is is invaluable. Uh, any any recommendation on the masterminds? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, um, one of them is I'm in is called Collective Genius. You have to do 100 flips a year to be in it. So if somebody's at a high level, they can be in that. Another one's Family Mastermind. A lot of them are a little bit, you know, like I said, I worked my way up a little bit higher level. If somebody's crushing it in the space and listening great. If they're not, that's where kind of my stuff would come into play. If somebody wants education, we we take newbies and help them kind of grow and scale that way. So I would say mine, because it's kind of a mastermind um, feel as well. If somebody's new, if they're super experienced, then uh, maybe, maybe Collective Genius or something along those lines. All right. Uh, what is the one best advice you'd like to give to our listeners any business or investment advice um i would say uh be okay with failure um most people avoid failure and it, it, it's an odd thing 
because failure is literally a stepping stone to success. Like you're not going to succeed without failing first. So I don't think most people realize if they avoid failure, they literally avoid success. You're not going to see success without failure. So I think yeah. just shifting your mindset that it's okay to fail. Uh, it's a part of the process. Just get up quickly and yeah. fail as little as you can. But if you have the expectation that you're going to fail to a certain degree, then it's not devastating when you fail and you get up quicker. If you have the expectation that you're never going to fail, when you do fail, you are going to be devastated or you're not going to fail because you're not pushing yourself. So I, th I think just the biggest thing is just understand that failure is a part of the process. It's OK. It's almost a rite of passage. Expect it. Learn from it and grow, uh, because if you're if you like avoid failure at every turn, you will never be successful. Yeah. And uh, because of uh, the risk to fail, don't stay on the sideline. Just jump in. Uh, you'll learn eventually. I love it. Yeah. Right. OK, uh, Sam, final question. How can Decoding Cashflow listeners get in touch with you? Yeah, just I'm on all social media platforms. I have my own podcast, The Faster Freedom Show. I would say the biggest way to connect with me personally is message me on Instagram. I'll just look up Sam Prim or, or Sam Faster Freedom is my company's Faster Freedom. And then my name is Sam. So Sam Faster Freedom is kind of my handle on most social media. So uh, just reach out to me on Instagram, shoot me a message there, and I will respond and give you a free resource if you're looking for one, connect you with uh, somebody if you're looking for it, or, or introduce you to my, to my mentorship if that's what you're interested in. But either way, just reach out there. Be glad to talk. All right. Sounds good, man. All right, Sam. Thanks a lot for being on the show, taking some time out. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Appreciate you having me. Thanks for listening to Decoding Cashflow, brought to you by Aster Capital. If you found value in this episode, then please share it with someone who you think could benefit from it and make sure to act on what you've learned. If you want Ted Patel to personally help you reach your goals, then feel free to set up a one-on-one -on -one call with him. Also, visit us at astercapital.com for more free resources. The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. As always, please consult your own advisor before making any investment decisions or setting a course of action. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of Decoding Cashflow, and we'll catch you in the next episode.